Saturdays night owls on Greatest Hits Radio. You never know who's going to call next. 0191 488 3188. Greatest Hits Radio. Now, we've got Mark who says, I don't know, I've got old tech all over the place. Here's just a few of the things I've got lying around. Three VCRs along with loads of VHS tapes. The first PlayStation, first Xbox and the 360, iPhone 4 and 5, currently using the 6, PC running a dual-core processor, Windows 98, second edition, Windows XP, that was a copy, Shh. Panasonic, <laughs> with loads of cassettes, and the first Nokia mobile phone. I would have thought you'd probably build, build a wall of your house using that. So what tech have you got? And is there any tech that you've actually got that you can't use? That's the question. Also, of course, we are finding out about Jean's birthday. Jean's a regular on the show, and she celebrated this week her 108th birthday. Uh, it's incredible she's lasted this long. Uh, I saw it in one of the newspapers. There was a photograph of her and a lady, uh, I think some sort of care attendant, giving her a cake to celebrate her, I'm sure it was Jean, 108th birthday this week. We congratulate her. And it is people of that kind of vintage, I suppose, that can remember this kind of thing. Officer got shot. Right. And come through his mouth and oh. over his neck. Right. And yeah. uh, did you see that? Were you there with him at the time? Yeah. Oh, bless. How do you live with visions in your head of that kind of stuff? Well, that's not the worst of it. No? What was then? My best friend got blew up. Oh, no. Where was this? Was this an island too? Yeah. A lamppost bomb. A lamppost bomb. So they, what, they put a bomb next to yeah, a lamppost? Two, two police officers. Right. Irish. Uh-huh. There was a bomb in the post. Right. Blew them up. Uh-huh. 150 pieces. And, and we had to pick them up. You had to pick up your friend's pieces? Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Woman, plastic parts. Pick up the parts of his body in plastic bags. Yeah, and it's 150 bits. 150 pieces. I do, as I say, I don't know how I'm you... Bomb. I just don't know how you guys can carry that kind of image in your head and and live with it. It's horrific. You hear many stories of post-traumatic stress. Maybe you're living one. Pick up your telephone, 1914. Double eight three one double eight. Memories of a very different kind coming in from Jan in Gateshead. We mentioned at the top of the show cassettes. Really, <laughs> cassettes. On the way back. Hello, Jan. Hello. Hello. Now I, I don't know about you, but if cassettes are on the way back, we're going to have to get those old-fashioned pens mm. that are exactly the same shape for winding again. Do you remember when the, if ever the tape came out, you had to put a pen in and go, wind, 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 for about three days? Yeah, I do. Oh, <laughs> blame me. Do you oh. never guess what I, I used to do? What's that? We, we had some paper, book, pens. I used to play, like, the, uh -huh, whatever, all the music. <laughs> and I used to do, like, the first two sentences of what you said, rewind the tape. Uh -huh. Write all that down, and then I used to say, where's the last word? Oh, I, that word there. And then continue it and just keep on going back and forwards with the teeth cassette. So I was ready for the discos, <laughs> <laughs> and I knew every word of them. <laughs> uh, it's good, though, isn't it? No, well, I, I remember, because back around, like, the disco time, there, right. was a, there was a magazine out, and I can't remember. It was called something like... R record mirror or record something, and it right. it didn't have any features or stories about pop stars. All it had was the words to all the songs that were in the charts at the time, and people used to buy it and do exactly what you did, read mm. it, learn it, mm. know, so that you could put all your moves to the right words and look like you really knew what you were doing up on the dance floor. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, 
last race for death. We used to, we, I tell you what, we were doing that with an old tape cassette. Right. Or playing out, outside and playing kicky can and stuff like that and <laughs> going into everybody's parents' house, getting fed. Yeah. And then we're all piling to the other parents. But them days, you, you could trust parents. Couldn't you? Around your little pink, you could. Because what we used to do was we sometimes would get like two or three dinners, and it was uh, quite clever because <laughs> one of the lads in the street would say, "Is it all right if Alan comes for a, for, for dinner on on Tuesday?" Oh, Tuesday, because his, his parents are going to be away. Can he come here? Oh, yeah, okay. And then you'd say to the other one, "Is it all right if Billy and, and Alan come?" To, to, the parents are away. yeah, okay. So you end up getting soup at one, a couple of sandwiches, a hot dog at another one. Brilliant. You still, it's a good door, isn't it? Yeah, you could you could play parents. I don't know whether you can play them quite so well now. No. But you used to, that's for sure. Well, you, it kept us occupied, writing <laughs> and playing, keeping us out of trouble. Yes, isn't it? can't argue about that. Not, not a question about it. You know it. what I've done today? What's that? I went to see the uh, poppies at Eldon Square. Right. And the knitted poppies. All the way around the metal yeah. railing. Yeah. It's fantastic. Amazing, isn't it? And I was reading some of the memories and notes and that. And then I went into Eldon Garden, look at some art. Right. Some good artists out there. There you right? go, you, you arty then, type. Right. Uh, but then, this is what I've done today. I've just wandered around the town and I've seen some homeless people. Some oldish people. Mm. I'll, I'll give them a tenner, some hot food, mm. and I've had chit chat with them. Nice. Right? Nice. Loved it. Nice, absolutely. Right? Good stuff. And uh, do you know them Pampa Hampers? Mm -hmm. We've got the final total. I've raised £2,500. That is brilliant. That's them three gone. Yeah, true. Now I'm concentrating on. No change in life. Right, yeah. Where you, a big builder's bare stop off, drop off point. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're all collecting for the change in life. That's right. Hey, you've but you know started, what I you've started really something want? now, Jan. Well done. Do you know? I, well, I kind of get out my system. Mm. I just don't know what's wrong, Alan. I just want to <laughs> go through one of them trends. Well, no, you've 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 achieved something, and now you want to achieve more. It's it's a kind of natural reaction, but well Is done. It? I didn't know that. Yeah. I just want to, but I've uh, I'm gonna. I've been tweeting out to people for woolly hats for right. ladies and uh -huh. men. Yes, because it's not just people do fall, and when they fall, they fall hard. Right. So I reckon uh -huh. people should help. People, because it could have been them. No, no question about that. Hey, good stuff. Isn't it? Absolutely. So I'll be collecting woolly hats. Right. Keep them warm. Definitely. But now them old cassettes kept me busy writing <laughs> and rewinding. <laughs> well, I just think it was hours of fun, and you just don't realise where the time goes when no, you've done that. Sure. Absolutely harmless, and you, you feel like you've really achieved something when you've got the whole thing done. Mm -hmm. As well, great. Jan, must move on, but thank you for right. coming on, love. Well right. done. See to you. Thanks, See darling. You, Take Thanks. it easy. Bye-bye. Tony's been on. He says the oldest tech, talking about some of the older tech stuff, the oldest tech he's got is my granddad's gramophone records. You know the hard ones that smash? Not the vinyl ones, the ones that, like China. He says he's got Mario Lanza singing the Donkey Serenade. He says it's bloody awful, but my granddad loved it. And I always think of him on Remembrance Day. Nice thing to do. To, to be there. However, tipping you the wink, especially if you're in the glory that is the Northeast, there's a show that you're going to want to see. So uh, I'm going to be telling you about that very, very soon indeed. And uh, my next caller, I think, is going to be Michael, who is uh, in High Wycombe. Let's head off in that direction and see what he's got to say. Hi, Michael. Good evening, Alan. Hello, sir. So what have you got for me tonight, then? OK. Um, 
Second World War story. Yeah. My grandfather worked, oh, was in the war in North Africa and Italy. Right. And he sent a watch back to my grandmother uh-huh. with a broken face. Uh-huh. Um, the next letter was, just wind up. Uh-huh. So it was a good quality watch, um, right. which was apparently broken, but um, just a little story. What I don't understand with stuff like that is, who's delivering the post? <laughs> you know, when when you're in the middle of a world war and everything's coming apart? Well, and, um, forces, um, how did forces it, post office. How did it, I know it's amazing, though, isn't it? Right in the middle of all of that, there's some postie still I mean, sorting I don't, through I, the way I, I don't know how long it took, <laughs> probably a few months, but I would it imagine. got there. That's fantastic. I mean, it's really incredible that anything would work in, in that. You know, you're surprised that it, its face was broken. That postman probably had to pick it up and run under gunfire. You know, the, who knows what was going on in the in the I journey of that watch from because, one set uh, to the I other. mean, I've got very little information about my grandfather. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. But I know where he was and when uh-huh. he was. Yeah. Um, my dad would did the same trip as your granddad. My my dad no fought in North Africa and then went across during the invasion and then halfway through his time there the Italians changed sides. Yes. And uh, he was at a, a battle. My dad was at a battle called Monte Cassino, which is yeah, I know, I know the one you mean. Probably the most famous battle of the the Italian yes. thing, and uh, all he's got to show for it's probably five or had to show for it should I say as he's passed was about five or six photographs of big, grinning uh, northeasterners sitting around fountains in Rome, you know, when they eventually <laughs> went through it. But it looks like it, it could have been somebody's holiday snaps. You know, here we all are. Da-da! Yeah. I, yeah Does, I, doesn't yeah, show you I, half I know, of what they went I know what you mean, but I think it was a little bit more than that. <laughs> I think so, too. No no question about it. And this is the, the, the thing that really frustrated me. I was interested in, you know, all of that. What my dad had been up to, I would have loved to have, you know, got got to the heart of the man. Never did, and uh, you'd ask him about them. So oh, we don't talk about that. And well, I'm thinking, no. well, how how do we get to know what you did unless, you know, unless you tell us? It's frustrating. I mean, I uh, my this is my grandfather I was talking about, uh-huh. and I also had a a great uncle in India, right, and a great uncle in the First World War, mm-hmm. and. I have so little information. It this is something that should be passed down, but mm. they they were so reticent to talk. Right. It is one of those situations that uh, I can understand it. No, well, I can understand it too. But I, I'm just nosy. I want to know more. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I want to find out. And if if your family doesn't get to know. Nobody else is going to ever tell, you know. And then I was asking my mom, and my mom says, "Oh, your dad doesn't like to talk about it." And I'm thinking, but surely at some time he's told you, you know. So, I don't. I, I think maybe it was a generation thing, but I think maybe, maybe so. they didn't really talk. Hey, well, maybe so. Lovely catching up with you, Michael. Thank well, you very one, much one, for your tell. One more, one more thing. All right, go for it. Derek eighty one. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's all. That was yours. Thank you very much. Talking tech. We're going to be talking to, uh, hopefully, uh, a rising star from a show that everybody should try and get to. I'm going to take a quick piece of music. Just kind of sum up the weather we've been having lately, doesn't it? Bit of madness there. Why the devil not? And we were telling you about a show that we are recommending that you go to, especially if you can be in the glory that is, of course, the northeast of England. At the stand in Newcastle, of course, place we love, Johnny and the Baptists. Now, a lot of you will hear them say, oh, I'm not sure I know them. That's fair enough. Um, And you may think, well, hang on, Uh, I thought the stand did, did, like, comedy. And this is just something just right out there. This is something that you will really like. It's a non-political kind of political show, which is... I tell you, let's just talk to them. Paddy's with us. 
from Johnny and the Baptists. Hello, Paddy. Hello, mate. How you doing? Good to talk to you. Congratulations on the success so far with this. It is. Oh, thank you so much. It's right up your street. It is the kind of thing that only you guys can really get away with. <laughs> That's enormously kind of you to say. Yeah, we we do our best. We're doing doing something a bit out there and a bit weird, but we're um. Yeah, we're giving it a go in the interest of pushing the boat, boat out, you know? <laughs> so what, what is it? Because some people say, well, obviously they're just a band singing a couple of songs that might have bearing on this or that or the other. Others say, well, no, this is actually like, this is proper drama happening right in front of you. So how do you describe what you do? Uh, it's a bit of a weird one because, we, you know, we fall through the cracks sometimes in terms of genres <laughs> and stuff. Like, But, I mean, you know, we're, we're both comedians and we're both musicians and um, when we met, we sort of wanted to write shows that were funny enough to be comedy, but the music was good enough that you could sort of, you know, listen to it on a bus right, and, right, yeah. and enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, we. but um, this show is mainly sort of about... We've done a lot of broad party, like, political shows uh, over the past sort of seven or eight years and... Um, yeah, we thought we'd set ourselves a bit of a challenge and uh, try and write a show that's more about uh, unity as opposed to division. Because I think we often say, like, oh, this party's done this, or we mm. don't like this way of living, or we don't, you know, and uh, this show is much more about sort of coming together. And so the politics in it are more personal than they are, you know, the party stuff. Uh, but it's mainly about love. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, the, the fringe, the kind of uh, rap that we've heard back from the fringe about you was like, this was breakthrough stuff. I mean, wasn't it? I mean, you, you must feel the momentum that it's given you. Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, it's you know, it's really lovely to have people say nice things about something you've worked so hard on, and uh, yeah. um, it's yeah, it has been. It, it, yeah, it is a, it, it's an odd one for us because it's definitely the show that we, we we're enjoying performing the most out of all our shows because you know we we did it at the Fringe and we previewed it before that and now we've been touring it since Edinburgh, so we've we've sort of been doing this show non-stop for about five months and normally by this point you're driving each other spare and uh, really you know you want to write something new and you want it you want it you want to change it and all this and this show um we're actually really at peace with and we really love it and it's every night's kind of a joy because we get to share it with people and see their reactions to it and it, it being right. a bit more of a sort of people watching our friendship and how it's how it developed and why we are what we're like as opposed to sort of just coming out and being like oh let's roll out an old show yeah. this, this one's exciting and this one i'm glad it's been well received because i'm i'm really proud of i'm really proud of it the thing that is weird especially now well first of all british politics at the moment has never been weirder so yeah. <laughs> when it comes to there being a shortage of material well i don't think so it's no. just we now, as a radio station, like many other radio stations up and down the country, choose not to talk about anything to do with politics because if you mention one ahead of another, you've got to get them all in, paraded one after the other, and life's, yeah. life's really too short for all of that. Yeah. And yet you're, you're digging in and, and almost turning into into rock anthems, all of that, yeah. all of that tribal stuff where... If you don't believe what I believe, you're obviously an idiot and you're doomed and yeah. your life's going to be crap forever. And you also take a look at privilege, which is yeah. something that in the entertainment business is actually, it's scary to scratch the surface because the, mm. even in entertainment, there's a fair bit of that kicking around. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, the privilege is rife throughout absolutely every industry in our society and it completely mm. forms who gets jobs whose voices get heard what yeah. platforms people are allowed and and you know and I, I johnny and i count ourselves amongst that you've got to be aware of your own privilege and the own mm. your own you know steps that you've got to skip to be able to get to where you are sure. um and i think to yeah to to ignore that is sort of uh, quite vile and quite unfair i think so yeah we've done we've done shows about that in the past and about sort of inequality and how that forms in a society like that. But exactly as you say, with politics at the moment, it's, um, I mean, people are getting it from all sides and it's, <laughs> it's occasionally quite difficult to, you know, we, we often gig as like, you know, a political political band, a political comedy act. And sometimes when you say, hey, you know, come and see my show, it's about politics. People have <laughs> they've heard that word 15,000 times in the last yeah, hour. People so they, are already 15 yards down the street by the time yeah, you've totally, said politics. You know, yeah. they, want, they want a break and, you know, and as entertainers and, you know, art, artists, for, for one, you know, of, of another word, it's like you, your job is often to give people a bit of a break and a bit of hope and something 
something that they can think about that's not part of the dreariness of what is going on in the news at the moment. So <laughs> that's part of why we, you know, tried to put our crosshairs on something different this time and say, right, what, what would it be like if two intensely political people tried to not write about politics and would it end up suffusing <laughs> into what we do or would we be able to avoid it? And, you know, it's... um. It's, it's been a bit of a journey, but... Um, I would imagine, yeah, though, that you will get, because just knowing what it's like, because first of all, uh, people say never talk about politics or religion, you'll end up in a fight. It's something, something, <laughs> it'll kick it, long kick off. Surely during some of your shows, you'll get somebody in there that is so very one party or the other. And again, I'm not getting into I'm not even going to mm. mention their names, but somebody will be so much that party that yeah. they take, do they not take offence at some of the things that that you say? Because one of the things that, that comes across loud and clear in the show that you do is mm. people of all descriptions, we all have to know when we're wrong and have the facility to be able to put our hands up and say, we thought we were right with that, but actually we weren't. And that's, yeah. that's <laughs> the hardest, because no politician wants to ever be seen to back down about anything pretty much yeah absolutely because i think it's it's sort of been imbued that uh, into people's psyche that that is a sign of weakness if mm. you're to ever admit to any kind of you know wrongdoing or fault in your own ideologies um especially when faced with someone else's argument that you're meant to listen to and consider and um yeah we you know we've johnny and i've had our fair share of um we have we have angered people in audiences, and we we tend not to. We're not you know we're not coming out on stage trying to trying to offend people. We we prefer sure. to make work that you know <laughs> tackles an issue and discusses it and looks into why something might have gone down a certain road or looks looks into why you know the populace thinks a certain way instead of going we are right you are wrong or we are wrong you because. You don't, you know, you, you divide you divide an audience enough times with the jokes that you do. Let alone, you know, if you throw it, you know, like, I don't want to suddenly be throwing curveballs at them all the time. You, you'll lose all of them. So, um, yeah, it's um, it, it, we, but yeah, there have been times in the past where we've come on and you know, if if people don't let you get to the punchline, sometimes it can look like you're very much on one team and you're right. having a go. But yeah, yeah. if people don't hear you, so we did have a few a few instances in um, some of our previous tours with. Um, like uh, we always managed to sort of get away with it, but we had uh, we had a lot of threats from people and a lot of um, yeah, like you know a lot a lot of a lot of old boys will come up to you at the bar afterwards and you know you, I don't know if you're going to buy me a pint or hit me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ride this out, you know. Right, right. Um, but yeah, this show we found hasn't done that because um, yeah, right from the get go we're talking about how can we unite everyone in this room and all have a lovely time together regardless. of uh, are you know what we think and what we believe is brilliant. I mean, you describe yourself as is you're not exactly like hell, I happen to be a rock star. You're a comedian. You, you write songs. You compose. You're an actor. You write your own stuff. You're a mm. bu busy boy. But I presume this this is doing so well. You're going to have to write this out because presumably more shows will come in. The more success that you have with it. I mean, yeah. I mean, hopefully. I mean, everyone everyone likes to have their work noticed and. It's um, yeah. I mean, Johnny and I both do a lot of varied things, and um, but this yeah. But I mean, Johnny and the Baptist is our main focus um, at the moment because it's just you know it's um, I, I I want to be I want to be live touring and um, showing <laughs> showing people that there is good in the world and hopefully not I'm not going out there to change minds necessarily. I'm not just you know give everyone an evening where at the end everyone goes you know what that was a bit of all right and we can all have a pint and it's fine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's an awful lot going on in our lives at the moment, and um, scoring is a bit non and is a bit non-stop. Um, but you know, it's the life we chose, and it's it's a really lucky and beautiful one to have. So yeah, I'm eternally were. grateful that anyone comes to the shows at all. Well, I think you're going to have a house full on the stand. It's this Tuesday. Get yourself along Tuesday to the stand. Check this out, Paddy, as one of Johnny and the Baptists. Brilliant. Even the name. People will will come and say, "Where's this band? Where's this band?" <laughs> you just know it's going <laughs> yeah, exactly. out. But I love that. I love that anyway. And hey, knock them dead, Pat. All the best, mate, and congratulations oh, so you. far. Thank you so much, and thank you for talking to me. It's been a pleasure. Never a problem. Take it easy. That's it. Oh, and just before we go anywhere, we have uh, Alison who sent in a picture of the record songbook, and this is exactly the book I was talking about earlier, where you would buy it every week, and it would have. 
essentially like the top 20 songs that were in the charts and any new ones that came in. Sometimes you'd want to learn a song, but it was in the week, be it was in the chart the week before. Oh, and you, you didn't get them, didn't get the songbook that week. So you're kind of stuck. Got to learn it from the record. Record, not, not download. The, the vinyl, as it was back in the day. And she simply says, Hi, Alan, I've still got these from the 1960s. Maybe the songbook you mentioned earlier. Note the price. Oh, I didn't. Oh, let me click, click back onto that. How much was it? Nine pence. Nine, nine P, which is not nine P modern parlance. That's nine pence um, short of a shilling, and a shilling was became five P. Uh, so, blame me, it would be a ridiculous amount, like one and a quarter pence, which is just unbelievable, but amazing. Thank you very much indeed. Never, ever thought I would see another one of those in my lifetime. But thanks to Jenny. Jenny Story was the lady concerned. I don't know where I got Alison from. Jenny, thank you very much. Jenny Story has a collection of the old record uh, uh, record collecting magazines from back in the 60s. What other stuff have you got from back then? Did you hold on to anything? Call Alan Robson's Night Owls now. 0191 488 3188. This is Real Life Conversation with the voice of the North. Greatest Hits Radio. You are with the big one, Alan Robson on the Night Owls, of course. And we are trying to get some calls in that you have remembered or been told, if ever any family ever talks about this kind of thing. Stuff from World War Two. Uh, why didn't they take any notice of the of the sirens then, the air raid sirens? Well, could nobody ever uh, drop by and see that guy decided to say, "Oh, well, that's a nice place. Come down and machine gun the high street." Yeah. Yeah. And it's just um, everybody's just shopping, and the Messerschmitt comes yeah, in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if they thought that was in the sale. <laughs> 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 well, well um, and of course, uh, Portsmouth was a well-known place for the uh, enemy to attack. How about that? Places that you were living, places where your family were. We want all those kind of stories. Anyway, our next caller in Ra is Bob, and he's with us in Anfield Plain. Hi, Bob. Hi there, Alan. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for calling, Bob. What are you talking about tonight? Well, it's funny, actually, because, yeah, I am from Anfield Plain, but I'm actually in Milton Keynes tonight, but I had to get my weekly fix of night out. So hey. you can night now. <laughs> well, thank heavens for that. So what are you talking about then, Bob? Well, it's, it's, it's funny. With the technology, the, um, I've, I've tried using e-readers and just right. can't get on with it. For me, I have to have a physical book with the pages to be able to turn the pages. But, well, the, well, the well hang, of... hang on. You've got, let's say, just Kindle, to, and I know other, other brands are available. Um, let's yeah. say you've got your, your e-book there in front of you. Don't you turn the page just by... Flicking it the same way that you would if you wanted to change your screen to the next one. I mean, isn't isn't that yeah, just like turning a page? It's no. It's all you're doing is sliding your finger across the screen. Whereas if you've got a book, it's a physical thing you can hold and you can feel the paper. And uh, I'm. It's really weird because my my job every day deals with modern technology. I, I'm a technology specialist for a major car manufacturer. Wow. So my role is is explaining how new technology works and, and making sure people understand how to use it. Right. But I'm still old school. I have to I have to pick up a book. I can't How the hell do I you get a job doing things. what you do when you've got these kind this is this is like the complete opposite of, of everything that you do when you work in life. It is, but the, see, sometimes the, the old ways are the best ways. <laughs> you see, I feel exactly the same way. I, I downloads of music. You go, I'm not excited. But if you said, no. I've got the latest CD by, or I've got the latest vinyl of, then you kind of get it in your hand and it's like, oh, look at this. Whoa. And you can read up about it because you take it apart and you get the, all the song lyrics usually are on one side or there might be a little book in it, you know, to tell you exactly. tell you all the stories and it is still paper and all of that. 
I love all of that. I mean, not just like, love it. But I, I have real problems getting excited. Even if it's my favourite band or, or whatever, they've got a new song out, it's available on download. As soon as I hear that, my heart kind of sinks a bit. Yeah, it takes the, the, the personal aspect out of it. Mm. Um, so often we, we, we download a, a film at home yeah. and I, I don't get excited until the, the, the physical DVD arrives in the post. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm with I'm, you. I'm exactly the same. I'm with you. And I know we're getting used to, I suppose, having to. I'm mean, because technology at the very beginning is a thing of choice. But once you put your foot in that water, for example, select any provider of television programs and movies online, once you do that, well, then watching a movie, even if if it's because there's a couple of them that say, well, you can see these movies while they're at the cinema. And you kind of go, so I can't even go to the cinema anymore now because... Well, why would I? Why would I spend you know twenty quid and and five pound fifty on the sweet department because of the pick and mix? <laughs> why would I go through all of that when I can just sit back and watch it here? But they're taking away, I think, facets of our lives. All of a sudden, there's, there's cinemas also, in your house and you don't have to leave. There's also another side to it. So, um, because I spend a lot of time working away. I often download a film onto onto my phone and I watch it that way. Right. And that's great. But uh-huh. what I've had recently is there's been two specific providers who have just sent an email saying, sorry, we're, we're no longer con- continuing, and they've folded, and all the films that I've paid for and downloaded, they've all gone. Oh, what? <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and you sit there and think, well, that's, that's why a physical copy, a, mm. a hard copy of a film, a DVD or a book, yeah. It's so much better because you, if the battery goes flat, you can still read it, you can still pick up, <laughs> you can still do whatever you need to do. And also with the CD, if okay, if one form of technology lets you down, you can go to another similar form of technology, equally cheap, and play it again. Or you, you get it fixed and off you go. But that piece of music or poems or whatever you've got, on that CD is yours forever, or if it's a DVD, exactly. that's yours forever. No, I get it, and I I, I just remember <laughs> the tra- life is full of tragedies when it comes to technology. My tragedy is different to yours. You know, any books is a big thing for you. Uh, for me, it was let's record all of the films that I've ever really wanted. I'll go back and I've got a little section for all those World War Two movies that I used to watch because my dad was in the forces and I, it got you excited. All those wild and woolly western John Wayneys, let's get them tucked away on my VHS recorder. And then you end up with an attic with about five and a half thousand tapes <laughs> with about six or seven films on each one because you managed to slow it down. you know. And, and, and then DVDs arrive... And you and you think, well, I'm going to have to now replace all of those films with a DVD because you you don't have a VHS in your living room anymore. You might have it in a yeah. shed or a, an attic, but nine times out of ten they're not plugged in, which means that renders all of that hard work in recording useless. It's it's exactly. dead. It's dead to you now. And they did the same thing. I just just when I got the I thought I had pretty much every hit record that I wanted on vinyl. Pretty much every one. And they say, I know that's old technology. The CD's just arrived. And you go, you are taking the mick. So now I've got to go. And then, of course, you get them all on CD, and then they say, new technology's coming in. They're all available on download. And now all that space you've got with a ton of DV, of, of CDs and DVDs, we're going to get rid of all of that. You'll not need any space at all. You can just download what you like. I would have, when they announced that, a lot of people might have sang and danced in the street thinking, isn't this wonderful? I could have shot them. I could have gone to their office and done them <laughs> harm because it, was, it wasn't about really the film and it wasn't really about the music. It was about I've, I've done something to get something that I really wanted and now I have it. 
and they took exactly. all of that away from me again for the second time. Oh, I don't know. No, I, I've got a, a loft full of cassettes and DVDs, <laughs> and but I've also got everything downloaded as well. So good if, man. If I lose one, I've still got it. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, but you know yourself, and I don't know about you when it comes to sound. Sound is kind of uh, anybody that works on the wireless. You'll guess they would say totally into all things sound and radio. I can tell you that I have played and still do many a download from a computer out over the airwaves. But if I was hosting a party on air, I would want to play that from a CD because you, yeah. get, you, get, a, you get a better kick from it in the same way that you used to when you, you played vinyl. You had pieces of music that were, if you heard them flat or you can hear them alive. I'd always want to hear them alive rather than, well, we recorded this first onto that, then we downloaded it onto the... And by the time you've got it housed in your library, it's been put in three or four different places. Well, I like a fresh yeah, one, if you don't thing, mind. People don't realise that if you're playing music from a download, in most cases, it's, it's been compressed. Yeah. So some of the quality is gone. Yeah, which is why yeah. I would always want to play it from... Source and source isn't yeah, exactly. the isn't the download library. Source is the actual physical thing, and uh, yeah. I for years I would do this. People would say that song sounded really different. Is it a new version? And you'd say, well, no, it's actually the original version before you compress it and start putting all of these all the things you do before you put them into a file. You know, there's there's a lot to be said for old tech. I think you and I can, can both admit to that. So problem is, if you're a boot guy, do you not just have a, a room that looks like uh, Lord Farquhar <laughs> Harson's house where it's wall-to-wall books all over the place? No, no. Um, what I tend to do is is I get specific books and they, they go in a, a little tiny box in the corner of the room uh, hidden away right? because... Uh, uh, the other half doesn't like books all over the place, so I, I have a special place for the books. <laughs> right. but, so, um, so you're, you're still not in the shed yet, though. So, I'm still in the house. So, respect to you for that, because <laughs> keeping a partner happy with a man's personal faves, like you know, people who like the computer games, you're not not in this living room. You're not. Okay, you know, it's, there's a, there's a lot of that going on. Hey, but well done. Keep up the fight, Bob. This this stuff you do during the day. That does mm-hmm. presumably uh, goes towards designing new cars. Then is it? No. Once once the technology has been designed, it's my job to bring it to life for the people who then have to sell it and use it. Oh, I see. Right. So, okay. Um, right. So yeah, I I have to understand how it works and find a way of explaining that to someone who is probably not tech savvy in that in that respect. To slightly thicker I, people. I no, I understand. No, no, no. no, definitely not <laughs> no I would be I one of those people. I would have been one of those people, Bob, and I'm, I'm, I'm humble enough to admit it. But thanks a lot, and hey, lovely talking to you. Thanks for coming. I appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. Cheers, man. Bye, bye. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Bob. He's not an Anfield plane. He's in Milton Keynes at the present moment, uh, but he needed his fix on the night elves. We thank him for that. So. Lots of things to talk about, including something that I have neglected. Got a nice one for you tonight. You can win yourself a Night Owls mug if you can work out a whole... This is a huge number of clues. The first one is quite simple. And if you get that and you get it right, you get the whole thing. But do not ring up until you've got all four clues. And uh, that means I've got to give you the fourth clue before you can ring up. Clue number one is this. A pair of rows of seats in a church. A pair of rows of seats in a church. A pair of rows of seats in a church. Hmm. Right, I don't see how far you get. Do I get a night owl mug up? For grabs, James in and it's Ford. Hello, James. Hi, Alan Mara. Hello, right. bit. Uh, you're on about the wall. Yeah. Hey, I've got a, I've got a canny story here. Oh, do. <coughs> Wait. 
you got to bear with us a little bit. Sure. My dad never mentioned much about the war, mm. but he was in Burma. Oh, blame you, right. Uh, he, he used to watch the tattoos every, he, well, uh-huh. every year, yeah. you know. And his dad was on the HMS Tiger for all the Second World War. Right. So there, but he never said no with the war neither. But like, what my dad did see was like the Japanese was really bad. Like, yeah. um, they used to have bad tortures and that, you know. Uh-huh. But he didn't go. You just said where well, you used to put like a rat in a bucket and sit it on the bucket. Oh. And there's only one way the rat would go, and that's one. But then he cut off after that. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. he had a he had a bit of a bad time. And, uh, and what, then what happened, this is when my story comes in, mm. in 1991, this is 1991, Alan. Right. Right? He took a mental breakdown. Oh, bloody. My so-called brother, I was taught my friend in the garden, my so-called brother, run past us, my dad was chasing him, and he went in, locked the door. Uh, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And he left me outside. Right? right, but my dad didn't know who anyway. I mean, he got us against a wall, and now he's had his had his gurga knife, and I thought, oh no, you know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't this sheep. I thought, well, if that comes, dude, I'm dead. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I talked him around. He was on with the devil and whatnot because he had a mental breakdown. So he went, but he went back home, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And I was I was not me, mate. I was going to get on the phone. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. you know. It was like two minutes, but. It, it lasted for about 15, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, yeah. then then my dad did, went back home and uh, <clears throat> we phoned him up, you know. Mm. And this is, oh, you got to phone the police. So phone the, the, phone oh, the police, blimey. you know. And uh, we had it for about 45 an hour, thinking, where, what's going on? Yeah, because he was, he, he did take a bad mental breakdown now. Right. I mean, but was the, was the <clears> mental <throat> breakdown about what he'd seen during the war? Because that's, that's an awful long time afterwards, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, 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 he must have been watching snow and telling us to kick ah, them off. right, yeah. You see, it just yeah. kicked them off. Yeah. And, and what happened was, um, there was no police come. But what did come, was then peace in the in everybody you know from the uh, the oh, army from the forces right there was jeeps and all sorts come uh, Alan and I'm going whoa what well, you know what's me I've been dear night in the war you know what I mean <clears throat> and uh, they said to me they says hey you got the key I says aye he says this is why we'll be behind you just I says will I <laughs> yeah. I says I says ye are you taking the Michael <laughs> you know what I mean. I says, what is that? He says, oh, we've got to come. It's, it's, the police kind of cope with it. Amazing. And, um, and it, but he was an old, he was an old bloke there now. This is the thing, because you would have thought if all of that was going to explode, that it, it would have done just, it before. Absolutely. Just as soon as he came back, really, as, uh-huh. as much as anything. Well, it didn't, Alan. No. And, uh, anyway, when they did, they caught him and he was asleep on the sofa and whatnot, and the, in the, it, it, it got sorted within two weeks, mate. Now, but right, right. but like the, the thing what got me was I asked him, you know, after he goes, but I'm not, and I says, oh, I says, what did you go through, Burma, like, you know? He says, don't mention it. This is the frustrating thing because I got exactly the same from me dad, and me dad didn't didn't go through any of the Burma related stuff. Right. Ne- never fought the Japanese at all. He was against the Germans and Italians, and then then just the Germans, but. Um, he would come back and he would say, I've seen some horrible things. And you, being a kid, you go, like, what? And then he'd That's just walk, did, just walk away. And you, uh, I, I know there's probably members of my family that do know the truth, but I, I want to know. Why, you know why, can't we, why can't we find it? Well, all, all my family will probably would now. The truth is they're gone now. And this is it. And it, uh, that's <coughs> the same in my family, absolutely. Uh, but there's another thing he had. He had a case, right? And he had, like, all his knives and whatnot in. Uh-huh. And he had things like... Uh, he had a Luger in. Blame me. Right. A German Luger. Uh-huh. And, you know, maybe in 15. Yeah. I, I thought, well, right, because he had loads of bullets and that, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know what happened to that gun. I, I, to this day, I don't know what happened to that gun. Anyway. Yeah, but that's the thing. It's probably on the streets causing mayhem. I don't know where that <laughs> went. But... but 
you know, I put like, a, <laughs> you know, everybody was out except me, me, me other brother was downstairs, uh-huh. and I loaded it up, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I dear. put like three books on the bookcase, you know, upstairs, <laughs> and I aimed it, uh, you know, and I just. Yeah. I, I, when I think about it, it could have blew me off because yeah. it, cause it never been fired since 1940, blank. You right. know what I mean? Sure, yeah. Then I fired it. And went, oh, hey, I missed the bookcases. I missed the books. And my ears, Alan, it ju- <laughs> the... <laughs> What did you hit? Yeah, the wall. And what happened was, you know, you have, you've got like two bricks on your wall. Mm-hmm. But it went through nearly the first brick, huh? Oh, blimey. And... I had the sellotape, you know, the uh, the wallpaper, <laughs> so it would match. To, the wall was still there. <laughs> the, wall was, the, wall, the, wall, the wall was still there, you know, but I had, like, sellotape, like, neat, really neat, you know, with clear yeah. sellotape. So, and I, I shifted the bookcase along a little bit. So, <laughs> <laughs> because I would have been... Dead of me for I had nah, a phone that. And it put me ears, Alan. Nah. Was about a day and a half just ringing and ringing and nah, ringing, man. you know. And uh, anyway, I put the I put all his stuff back exactly where it was, you know. And I, I unloaded the gun and I put yeah. the, you know, put put everything back. So oh, I hope he doesn't count the bullets or not like that, you know nah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and it may, it makes you wonder when you get these television programs, or Alan. Mm. And they're shooting in the houses. Yeah. You know. Some of them would have gone through wall. You know, because not every wall in, in a modern-day house is a brick wall. You know, you got this you yeah. your standard walls up there. And if you fired a gun in one room, it would go certainly go straight through the wall and through anybody in the room next door. Yeah. No, my point is, as soon as you pull that trigger in a gun's bang, mm. you're not able to go and bang again. It's because your ears just... Pop. Pop. Yeah. I mean, your first reaction is to get your hands and put on all your ears. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I was, I was panicking, Alan. I was panicking yes. when he come in. Oh, the sweat! He says, oh, he says, you're a bit hard on your chin, throw some of the And I was, oh, no, Dad. You know what I mean? I'm thinking, oh God, I'm offended. <laughs> and, uh, there was a few people at the top of the street going, "What was that noise?" And I'm going, "Shh." You know what I mean? Because you, you, you'll, you'll want to say stuff like, oh, I've just dropped a tray in the kitchen or <laughs> any, anything you could do uh, to kind oh, of cover it. Was it uh, was a noise and a half on. But, but <laughs> he, he had stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he never, ever hardly talked about the war. I know. It's fr- just frustrating, isn't it, though? That's the yeah. thing. Frustrating yeah. because I think every family's got like a million stories. And uh, right. we just don't get the chance to to hear what they are because uh, the families will not tell us, uh, or their or dads just want to hide the truth from us. And I kind of understand it if it, if it's what they need, if you know what I mean, to, for their right. own protection. I kind of get it, but I just think it's a shame. Just think it's a shame. I can't remember, but uh, but like but. What day he had, because everybody had the VAD and all that, you know, the, the, whatever it was, what day it is. But my dad didn't celebrate it that day. He celebrated it months after. Right. It, I, 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 and I didn't ask him why that is, neither. I didn't say, wait, hold on a minute. Do you not celebrate when Europe, when, you know, when you know my answer? Did you say, no, no, to celebrate? You right, know what I mean? Right. Amazing. Hey, yeah. good stuff, anyway, James. I'll, Thank you very I'll, much for coming keep on. Keep it hard, mate. Keep it hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. I love that. What a great story. I love the fact that well, you just move, there's a bullet hole in the wall. We'll just move the, move the bookcase along a little and try and get the wallpaper to match. You can imagine him doing all of those things. Got a bit of a superstar for you as well. Superstar Jim Kerr. Simple Minds. I'm not talking about his music, really. Well, there is a moment to claim. I mean, it, it, people say it doesn't get easier, man. It, <laughs> it was never easy, and it doesn't get easier. It's easier than getting down the main, but, <laughs> but, 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 but it was never easier. It's a mystery always the time. We, I mean, the first thing you go, there is all that stuff. That's the production and the style, but the body is always to do with the tunes and the words and, and, and uh, you know, getting them first. When you get them first and you think that mm. you're 
onto something there, then you can you've got something to really build on, and you right. can play with the style, and you can play with the production, and you you can bring things in and 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 try things. But um, but it's always about the songs mm. and and about how the songs are working, and and we're very hard on ourselves with that. And we work with a group of people. You mentioned them there, the 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 producers and the. the they came in and, and they, they kick the tires you know you right, go like yeah. yeah and they go yeah what do you reckon it's good yeah it's good so we're good no we're not good <laughs> why are we no good because it's no great right. And, right and it has to be great so something's missing what are we going to do and and then that's where you got to roll up your sleeve and try and work mm. it out what what the puzzle is here night owls <laughs> With Alan Robson. You never know who's going to call next. Oh, we have a trillion things to talk about tonight and a bit of a special a superstar with a word for anybody who may well be serving in the forces uh, here or there. I had just been sent, the real Santa Claus has uh, been in touch and says, Alan, just a few pictures from Dalton Park's Christmas parade. It was a fantastic day. Hope all the boys and girls enjoyed the day. We had the reindeer and sleigh out right through the shopping centre. Some lucky boys and girls got to ride with me. Next, I'm going to be in Billingham next week, escorted by the brothers from Mother Mother's motorbike group, going down to see the boys and girls for a street party and the lights turn on. Still able to listen to the show via Alexa here in Lapland. So keep up the great work. That's from Santa. Hashtag I believe. Hashtag no fake beard. That's the way you tell. Always give it a tug before you tell them what you want for Christmas. That's uh... <laughs> No, we don't want a fake. We're not having that. Now, somebody that I've followed for uh, the longest time is a guy called Rob Kilburn. He is the creator of Tain and Weird. And he's usually just got something going on. We're going to find out what it is right now because he's on the end of the line. Hi, Rob. Hi, Alan. Uh, thanks for having us on the show. No worries. Good to talk to you. Now, the project, your latest project, is a thing called Our Cup of Tea. Tell us all about it. Yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's a sort of northeast uh, underdog story that some of you might already be familiar with. Um, it's sort of like a short documentary that we've made uh, in partnership with Moving Adverts, which is a sort of Dubai-based uh, media company run by um, a sort of local fella called uh, Russell Howes. And it's kind of like a, an underdog story, really, of the, the sort of uh, big precursor to the, to the First World Cup. Right, yeah, the, the story of West Auckland, who, again, had this incredible opportunity to kind of represent Britain... Uh, in the the first World Cup, and and not just represented, but actually win the thing. That's exactly right. Yes, so, so Th- Thomas Lipton was some sort of Lipton T. Um, he sort of uh, picked West Auckland to go across in 1909, and then again in uh, 1911 to sort of compete against all these different football teams for what essentially was um, the first World Cup. Yeah, and West Auckland, this this sort of team of miners, people who've spent their whole life underground. Um, toiling away, have been sort of plucked really to cross over the seas and over the countries to to go and compete against all this international talent. So it's, it's a pretty big underdog story. No, it's one of the all time great underdog tales. What led you to it in the first place, though? Because it, it, it as I say, it is a, a long, long time ago now. It's over a hundred years. Yeah, like, see, I mean, it was, it was something that we sort of worked um, in partnership with Moving Adverts, and it was their initial interest. Um, but, I mean, b- by all means, it's, it's, it's sort of been quite a sort of well-known story in some parts mm. as well, because, obviously, Dennis Waterman did the film in the 80s, yeah. um, the World Cup of Captain's Tale. Uh-huh. We've actually got Tim Ely, who was a character in that, um, sort of narrating the documentary itself as well. Great. So, I mean, it's all there. Uh, this is something that, that's a bee in my bonnet and always has been. You know the kind of stuff mm-hmm. that I do... And it's just, we should know our own history, <laughs> and yet we don't. And, I mean, there'll be a lot of people that say, what, West Auckland won the World Cup? Yeah, yeah. Uh, b- yes, <laughs> but we should all know that, and we should celebrate it. And uh, to be honest, I think it deserves, no disrespect to Dennis, but uh, I, th- I think it deserves a bigger uh, and film. Are, yeah. It needs a new yeah. movie, doesn't it? The whole thing, it's... Because it, to to think about, if you said a group of uh, professional footballers from this area gathered together to become 
Well, you can kind of think, what would they have a chance if they were the best mm. footballers yeah. in Britain at the time? You know, the the uh, the Bobby Charlton's of their day. But we weren't talking about that. We're just talking about a group of miners who just had the bottle to give it a go. I mean, what? What a story. Well, well that's exactly it, really. And I'm, I, mean, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think especially with sort of working class history, a lot of it does sort of become um, sort of overlooked or overshadowed. Um, but this is definitely one underdog story we've tried to put together in a sort of definitive documentary with a lot of sort of photographs, as I say, people involved in previous projects. And, I mean, the story of West Auckland is, is is one that sort of continued on. I mean, that original cup was stolen in the 90s, um, sort of after that 80s film, and it's, it's been missing ever since. So whether that's still out there in someone's under someone's bed or, mm. or who knows where, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that's still ongoing. Well, I seem to remember when the, the 1966 World Cup went missing... It needed mm-hmm. some dog to sniff it out, and he found it in some bushes or something. So we need to find what what that dog was and get maybe he's a, a member of its family lane to try and sniff out <laughs> the, the original one as well. But, I, I mean, just the, the fact that they won it at all, the fact that yeah. we're, we're, we're talking about it, it says we haven't forgotten about these incredible people because they are our ancestors here in the north. And we should uh, we should take a close look at the story. If people want to have a look at it, where do they go wrong? Yeah, I mean, you can head over to sort of Tyne and Weird, which is um, where we put out our sort of documentaries, or on the Facebook page as well. I mean, we work on a lot of the sort of films we put out really are um, sort of essentially working class histories, things like uh, the sort of rave culture here in the northeast that was massive in the 90s um, and late 80s and things like graffiti and parkour and more sort of uh, urban sort of working class culture as well. Um, but, yeah, that's the YouTube or the, or the social media, uh, Tyne and Weird. Fantastic. Hey, well, keep on being weird. We appreciate <laughs> it. We need it. We need more, not less than that. And thanks for talking to us, Rob. Good catching yeah, up. Yeah, thanks man. for having us on the show. No worries. Take it easy, mate. Bye-bye. You too, bye. There you go, Rob Kilburn. There is, uh, There are weird people out there that uh, we need to keep us fueled with the amount of weird that we enjoy on a daily basis. And uh, we like a fair bit of it, don't we, really? Now, a little bit earlier on, we were given, uh, according to the research, the bottom line when it comes to marijuana. Official report, million, it's led millions of people to try harder drugs because it's usually your first taste and uh, have a joint and uh, sit around being cool or pretending to be cool. Uh, But it's led to over 40,000 suicides. And recently, a man uh, high on marijuana, believed he could fly, decided to step out of a 120th floor of an office block, landed on a young girl and has ruined the rest of her life too. To talk about such things and, of course, that can- amazing cancer news we got before, we've got Katie in Walker. Hi, Katie. Hi, Alan. Hello, darling. So what's your view on all of this, then? Right. What it is is I got diagnosed with uh, uncurable cancer um, a couple of weeks ago. Right. And what it is is I've been trying the cannabis oil. Right. And, uh, like, of my me, of me husband, he says, well, um, that's your last option. So I've been trying it, and uh, I feel a difference in it. Great. And I think it should be, um, like... Brought over, the, over the, yeah, and for other people to try for any conditions. I think it should be legalised. Now, two two things on the back of this. You you say that you've got an a, an incurable cancer. Yes. And bless you, let's, let's hope that we can prove them wrong. Yes. One way or another. It might be worth you asking your doctor about CF33. Right. So you've got that CF33. Right. Because today in the national press, and it was in seven different newspapers, so they've got this story from somewhere, right. scientists have created a new virus that can kill every sort of cancer. Oh, right. And it's called CF33. Oh, right. Now, it might be early days for you, where, right. you know, to get your hands on this kind yes. of stuff, but usually they don't put it in the press until they're a little way down the road with trails and what have you. Yeah, that's right. So between the cannabis oil, and I've got friends who whose family have cancer, they're all doing the cannabis oil thing. Yes. And I would, I would, to be honest, it's not for me to recommend or, or not. Yes. But but if if that's what's available and there's plenty of people saying it's made a difference for me, 
I would give it to anybody that I loved in Well, I've seen on the internet there's loads of stories. Yeah. Um, like this man had 12 little tumours in his head wow. and it took six months and, and he was cured by the cannabis oil. Brilliant. It's, you know, wow. so there's more positive to it. Absolutely. No, I, my view... Do you know, I think one of the things about cancer, and I'm not a medical person remotely, what I'm about to say might not have any bearing whatsoever... But it appears to me that a big part of the cancer thing is believing you can make it. Yeah, you've got to have positive... You've got to be just up for it. You've got to be up for the fight and say, well, I'm going to prove them wrong. Yeah. uh They say this. Well, we'll see about that. Yeah. And I think people that go into it saying, this is not going to be the end of me... Yes. I've got a long way to go yet. That's the kind of person that yeah, gets you've through got to be it. Positive, that's it. And they come out the other side and say, "Well, how, how did that happen?" They yeah. said because it was a friend of mine who had that kind of attitude that nothing's going to stop her. Mm-hmm. And uh, the rest of us hearing this because she, she had three different tumors and one was wrapped around her this and it was affecting her that and you're thinking yeah. oh hell's bells well you see mine was wrapped around me um, bowel and say because I've got like a stoma bag through the cancer gotcha so yeah that sounds very similar to, to what she was told it's yeah just, because of this it's strangling that and it might harm this and you're going to need that and she told us all of this, but she says, I'm not worried about it at all. I'm going to get through it because I've got two young kids and I'm yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to leave them without a mother. And yeah, she's got that positive thing. Hard brain yeah. and a, a good damn reason to fight as well. It is. And uh, she went ahead, did the cannabis oil thing, but did the chemotherapy thing as well. Yeah. So you never know which one was doing the, the good stuff. But whatever it was, they said that she ha- would only have at the best 18 months to two years. Right. And uh, she's still going, and that was that was 14, 15 years Jeez, ago now. Right, yeah. So she's still going. But she's got to the point now where the doctors don't even come in and check her. Yeah, yeah. She's got to the point where they say, well, there's nothing we... It, it is what it is. You're, you're surviving. You're, you're going. Yeah. And uh, they check her, and they say that all the cancers have shrunk. They're, they're not getting any bigger. But she's kept on. She hasn't kept on with the chemotherapy, but she's kept on with the cannabis stuff. Oh, that's great. Well, I had chemo. That didn't work for me. So, no. yeah, it works for some people and it works for hey, not yeah. some people. I don't care what saves. You just get saved. Yeah, that's time. right, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, CF33. Right. Ask your doctor about it. New virus. It can kill every sort of cancer. Now, you c- they would not put in the press can kill every sort of cancer. Uh-huh. Not just the curable ones. They've said every kind of cancer. So, oh, that's great. So it's worth, worth a chat. It is, yeah. I mean, can you make it happen. Love to you, Katie. All Thank the best, you, Alan. Alan. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And now you see, don't you want to fight for her? Wasn't she great? Absolutely amazing. What I'm going to do next, though, is I'm going to share with you one of the just most beautiful love songs that that's ever been from somebody who coincidentally has just got himself clear of his cancer battle and he's looking better than ever. I don't know whether you saw him over the the last weekend dancing and singing with Scotland fans. Right, could only be Rod, couldn't it, really? Uh, Isn't that a great tune? Rod Stewart, you're in my heart. The greatest hits you are with Alan Robson on the Night Owls programme. Got some more. Actually, slightly crazy music coming up very soon. Also going to be talking to George from Lanchester. I wonder what that's about. But just before, Marie's been on. Been talking tech tonight, haven't we? And says, hi there, Alan. I still have some of my old cassette tapes from the 80s. I've got no idea what condition they're in, though. Not having played them for at least 15 years. And the only way I could play them now would be on my old Sony Walkman. Coincidentally, this is the same Walkman that I first discovered Night Owls on when I was 12. You say cassettes are making a comeback? Does this mean that cassette players will too? Yes. And still have a load of VHS tapes. People kept urging me to get rid of them, but as many of them were gifts when I was a child, I couldn't part with them. I was trying to replace all of them on DVD, never got round to it because I tend to spend spare cash on audiobooks. I've got an old slide phone with actual buttons that I still wish I could use, an old iPhone 5C, two old iPods, 
Two MP3 players, and my brother's just convinced me to update my phone and iPod, so now I've got an iPhone 10. One thing that surprised me about the newer phone is it's quite a bit bigger and heavier than the old one. First time I took it out uh, with me after getting it, I had to take a bag with me. It was too big to fit in my pocket. Extremely inconvenient. Do you think that in a few years those phones will be brick-sized like the ones in the 90s? Um, I'm sure I'd come across a great many other relics if I cleared out some cupboards, but those are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. And I would just like to take a moment to say that my thoughts are with all of the people who have witnessed war. Those of us lucky enough to have been spared such devastating horrors can't understand, of course. But acknowledging their suffering would be a start. Hope you're well. Lots of love, Murray. Murray, thank you very much for that. Quick break, then we're going to let George loose on you. This is Real Life Conversation with the voice of the North. This is Night Owls with Alan Robson. Call 0191 488 3188. Greatest Hits Radio. You are with the big one. Whatever you want to talk about, we will do some of that here. Now, we hanged a lady, obviously, talking to us about how terrifying it must be to be in a war and how lucky most of us are never to have been in one. We took a call from somebody who was involved in World War Two. When they were 17. What happened to you? He's 17, your he dad's He was 17, brother. my dad's brother. He was, um, he shouldn't have been in, but he lied about his age. Right, just to get and, in. Yeah, well, I mean, they didn't scrutinise the age no. thing very much then, these. No. And uh, he was sent straight out on the front line and he was killed. So he was killed in action. Right. And um, we've got a photograph of him. And Was um, he in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force? Army, DLI. Oh. Right. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, as I say, it's, I didn't know much about the war. My husband, I mean, he's a bit older than I am, and uh -huh. he used to say he used to stand and watch the bombs dropping. Right. Because we used to live in Nobby Hill then. Uh -huh. And oh, blue, uh, yeah. he used to stand at the top of the, the hill, watch it. him and his mate used to run out and watch the bombs dropping, and their mother just grabbed them in, you know. There's so many people have oh, said that yeah, over yeah. looking down from Bench and Bank where, you can, right, see, where right. you can see the whole Tain Valley... Uh -huh. Yeah, used to watch yeah. the German planes coming in and that's strafing right. Vickers Armstrongs. Yeah, well, that's right. That's what he used to tell us. He used to watch for the planes coming across. And Can you imagine, though, that? Because oh. we see films about... I think the, the one that kind of brings it home is whenever we watch those films about Pearl Harbour, like the, yeah, the modern yeah, Pearl Harbour, yeah, yeah. where people are just walking and over their heads the yeah. enemy planes are flying. Yeah. You don't think oh. that that happened right here in the North East? Well, it, it must be horrific, really. I mean, you know how we, I know how we cringe yeah. here when they've got these uh, planes out and they're flying, you know, they're yeah. just test flying. Uh -huh. And to be honest with you, it goes right through me when I hear them, yeah. you know, knowing that they're going to go into action, some of them, yeah, because, they, I mean, the situation as it is today, everybody's aware of. There you go. Uh, if you've got any tales to tell, uh, got any family stories, things that your parents or grandparents have, have told to you, Oh one nine one four double eight three one double eight. Make sure that you get yourself uh, heard across uh, Greatest Hits Radio. We would love to hear from you, so make it happen. Now we mentioned George from Lanchester. Let's head off in his direction. Hello, George. Good evening, my man. Hello, uh, How you doing? No, not bad. Not bad. Very good. It's damp again. I see. Uh, well, why don't you wipe it with a towel? <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> oh, that, that, do, do, do you know how how easy it is that uh, a program like that, and in fifteen seconds we can totally lower the tone. It did happen just I there. Think it's sorry. Brilliant. sorry, everybody. Hey, mind you, on seeing that, we talk about how scary World War Two would be for people <laughs> that can see. I would imagine for people who can't, how do you put that into words? Ah, well, uh, I was at my first boarding school in World War II, right. and uh, my memories actually, 
all, all the staff, all the male staff, gardeners and the teaching staff, whatever, they all had rifles. Right. Uh, oh, and wow. wherever they went, their, their rifles went with them in the classroom or, wow. or with the gardeners outside. Wherever it was, they had their rifles. And, I, uh, thought, I thought the kids in my school were rough and we only got the strap and the cane. Oh, well, <laughs> you should have... <laughs> Right, uh, Hazel has uh, uh, two cousins in in the U.S., and uh, both of them were teachers. And they, uh, one in particular, uh, she had uh, a junior class, wow. which I think was about uh, the average age was ten. Right, and she had an armed guard in the classroom. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, with a shotgun across his knees. How about that? And she she uh, uh, had a um, a sixty mile trip from where she lived to the school, so it was a hundred and twenty miles round trip. And she always kept a, a gun in her car. Right, right. So you know that that's the states, though, isn't it? No, for sure. But I mean, for you as children. And I know, obviously, it was, you didn't see they had rifles, but the, the, out of the limited vision that you had back then, presumably you could you could see the fact they were carrying something that was later told to you to be to be a rifle. How did you feel about that? I mean, they weren't there, obviously, for your persecution. Well, well, no, but it it well the, the thing was it was normal. Right. You, you know, you saw you saw these things every day, uh, and. Uh, we we weren't uh, we weren't allowed to to handle the the rifles obviously but we were shown what the ammunition was like, right? You know the actual bullets if you like, uh -huh. uh, and uh, what each each Christmas uh, we of course we were small kids. Mm -hmm. uh, German prisoners of war used used to bring toys that they'd made, wooden toys and whatever, absolutely beautiful. And the, these were uh, young men, mm. uh, and I'm damn sure when I when I think uh, of uh, the the Christmas party and these these young German uh, prisoners of war, mm. uh, they, they used to be in in tears because they'd be thinking of of their families at mm. home. Yes, yeah. uh, and they they weren't Nazis. I mean, it 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 uh, it was. Hard, hard for them mm. as well. This, uh, this is the thing, though, because it, it's very difficult, uh, even in... And I watch a lot of the documentaries about the time. I've watched a lot of movies about it. it to, to me, the hardest thing is you, there's two different types of mindset in Germany. There's the, uh, the Nazi and the German... And the German people in general seemed to be loving what Hitler was doing because industry was going fast and far and people could make good money and they'd taken a lot of the industries away from the Jewish population, which was putting more hands into the, the German population. So I, I could understand how you can get that kind of... It's not right, but I could understand how you could get people motivated by that. It's just how do you know... That that German soldier that might well be in—I mean, Scotland and Northumberland had an awful lot of German prisoners during World War Two. How do you know the guy behind the wire is just an ordinary bloke dragged into it, or whether he's a, a heads down in charge Nazi? I mean, that's uh, how do you how do you work that one out? Well, the the the, the business of, of how well. Uh... When, when the industry in Germany, uh, when they were preparing for war and whatever, in actual fact, the the, the uh, average German person had a rougher time of it than than uh, our civilians did over here. Right. right. Uh, and uh, they, I mean, as as in the First World War, that Christmas when the 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 Germans and the British came out of the trenches and the, they were swapping presents and playing football and whatever. Mm. They, they the, the next day they were they were at it again. Sure. But it showed that they they didn't want to to be in this situation. Mm. 
uh, and uh, it, it's the, the politicians. If the politicians were in the front line, there wouldn't be any wars. I yeah, I guarantee that. It was funny also, and I, I read a quotation. Uh, I'm, there's a book that I'm reading at the present moment. It's about uh, history of the last like 150 years and how the major changes and the political backstabbing and all the, the essentially same old tosh that's going on right now. Um, and the Queen, the Queen Mother, as was yeah uh made a quotation during the blitz and she said i'm so glad that the germans have dropped bombs on buckingham palace and everybody kind of looked at her and went what and he says well now i can hold my head up when i go out in the east end you know it's because the east end had been really badly bombed and i i, I get that absolutely you know now yeah. now we're all one people we're, we're the same she has an idea of what it's like to have, admittedly, she had many homes, but she had uh, an idea of, of what it was like to be uh, very close to death and, and having her home uh, damaged oh, yeah. and, and whatever. Yeah. And uh, she she could uh, sympathise more with, with people Mm. Who, who had had their homes destroyed? But I mean, they they hadn't got any other home to go to. Right, sure. Uh, and uh, but you know, you were talking earlier about uh, that other chap, and and uh, he liked reading uh, paper books. Yes. Well, I, I can tell you this: I, I'm absolutely delighted about audio books. Sure. Because because obviously uh, yeah. a book like. Um, Say war, war and peace, which is a great long, <laughs> long book. Now, in Braille, that is eight separate volumes, and each volume weighed about two and a half oh, kilos. My goodness, no. uh, can you imagine if you wanted to to cart the whole thing around? You, you'd very nearly need a wheelbarrow. Right. So, uh, I, 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 I'm absolutely delighted that uh, you can get uh, what I call talking books and, right. and whatever you can download them. Absolutely brilliant. No, it's worked. It worked out absolutely in your favour, of course. Oh right? yes, no, yeah, no question uh, about that. Uh, my my dad, uh, when he was fourteen and a half, this is World War One, mm. uh, to get a meal, he joined up. He, he lied uh, about his age, and uh, he he joined up, and of course he was fed and whatever. Uh, and by the time he was sixteen, he was a prisoner of war. And in World War II, uh, he actually volunteered for the army again. And believe it or not, he was captured again. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 think, I think he was probably the, the first professional prisoner. <laughs> yeah, look, no, poor, I could, have, fella, I it, could it, do it, a lot of fighting, but instead, excuse me. Yes. <laughs> in, in the, World War One at fifteen, he he was part of uh, a machine gun crew. Right, and they they were overrun, and the others were killed. Mm. And uh, maybe somebody felt sorry for him nah. because uh, he was taken prisoner. Right. But uh, yeah, he he was in both wars, and right. uh, it it. Uh, it, it certainly left its mark on on him, mm, and uh, my my uncle in the First World War he he got gassed, right? And uh, he lived for about a year after the war, mm. but his lungs were totally Shredded. shot. Yeah, and yeah, uh, right. but but uh, the Germans started gassing, but we had to go as well. But it yeah. it was so unpredictable. All it needed was with the wind to change. And you've done it to your own. Yeah. Say it. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's 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 all, and uh, it was a very much hit and miss. And it's it's like our weather forecasting today. I mean, they they, they can't even get it right about rotten weather. No, absolutely. The interesting thing though about the the whole gas thing in the First World War, apparently, you know, there was obviously a use of a lot of horses, and they had gas masks for the horse. 
and apparently it was just like a sack co covering. Yeah, that's all it was. Very much like the feed bags that they got. So what would happen is that they'd say, oh, hang on, the mustard gas is coming. They'd get, they'd put the mask on themselves. You know, <laughs> one of those horrible old rubber things. Yeah. And then they'd put the, the bag on the nose of the horse and then try and get the horse to move forward. But the horse thinks it's getting fed, so all it's doing is reaching down and down and down, trying to get the food that it thinks is in is in the well, the, yes. the, the bottom of the of his food yeah. bag. Funny. When we were on holiday uh, just a very few weeks ago, uh -huh. uh, we visited uh, the museum that uh, near Gretna Green, oh, that right. was the where the explosives were made. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, the actual site of the factory was 10 miles long by 2 miles wide. Jeepers, and there were literally dozens and dozens of mini factories uh -huh. because there were often explosions. And the reason why they had a lot of tiny factories was if, if there was an explosion, it only took out a few at a time. Right. And not, <laughs> not a, a massive explosion. That's and I know, but for those people working there, why why are we so far apart? Well, if you blow up, they'll yeah. the other guys won't be bothered by it. And you're thinking, nice to know. But the, <laughs> the thing I I found at, at, at that museum, it was about a, a rail crash hmm. uh, near Gretna Green wow. in um, during the First World War hmm. that I'd never even heard about, and it was the worst rail disaster in the UK ever. Really? There was, um, on one train, there was 500 uh, soldiers who were en route to uh, go to Gallipoli. Right. And there were three three trains involved, and the whole battalion was wiped out. Out of 500 men, there were 59 survivors. How come we don't know that story? Though? Well, I because during the First World War, it, it was suppressed. Right, there right, there right, were right. five officers survived that crash. And the same day, they were on a ship uh, mm. and sent out to Gallipoli, but they had no battalion because they were all gone. Right, right. And uh, I, I'd never heard of, the, of this thing no, at all. No. And apparently uh, three trains collided and it was a real mess. And then an express train uh, travelling at 60 miles an hour ploughed into the wreckage. Right. And all oh. three engines uh, caught fire. Oh. And the fire was so intense, rescuers could hear people screaming, but they couldn't reach them and they were burnt to death. <laughs> wow. Absolutely horrible. Amazing. But the, the, the death toll was about 700. Right. But the yeah. whole battalion was, was gone. And I'd never heard of this incident at no, all. No, no. And, uh, but it was near near Gretna Green. Gotcha. Hey, George, thank you very much. Yep. Lovely to hear from you. Thank you for coming on. Cheers, mate. Take it care. That's great. We love George. Amazing. What a... What a batch of stuff he brought for us tonight. Going to have a quick, a, a twangy bit of music. If, if ever somebody says, oh, I fancy something a bit twangy. Now, you might think Dwayne Eddy with that that he used to do back in the day. But no, there's a twangier one. A little bit of Louise in with her old band Eternal and B.B. Winans. What a song that is. If you haven't heard that in a while, that was a one to get you moving a little bit. And it is now time that we do something quite famous. It's a blonde. And I am joined for a chin wag by Dawn tonight from the Switchboard. And also producer to the stars, Hollywood, McTody McShane. Hello. Right, OK, let's get to it. What is the blah? Well, we take a look at what's trending. We take a look at what is happening. I've got a little bit of personal news for rockers out there. Ooh. There's going to be a new double-header rock gig with about four bands on. But the two headliners, 
for the arena will be White Snake and Foreigner from uh, half American, half uh, half British man. So that's I can see that working pretty good. So that's coming to the arena. Check out dates if you're. Uh, will you be going? In the well, I, 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 I'm not, it's your cup of tea. Not working every night now, so um, <laughs> or, or will I? Is I, it your cup of tea? Let's hope. Obviously, if, yeah. I wanna, if I'm working every night, I can't mm, do it. Yeah, and that's where I want to be at the present moment. Yeah. Otherwise, it's absolutely right up my street. Right, okay. Let's have a look at Monday's national newspaper front pages. See what is being said on the thing that they're going to ram quite firmly through your letterbox if you've got it ordered. The Guardian. Nearly half of rape victims decline to go ahead with prosecutions. Does that surprise you? It does, but I suppose it's it's a scary it, thing. It doesn't really surprise me. Why? Because the statistics for the amount of p- cases that go to trial and the amount of convictions is enough to put somebody off anyway because you're going to think, well, what's the point in putting right. myself through that? But you see, on on the flip side of it, for me, I, I talk a lot to the police who deal, obviously, with that. And they say they're sick to death of going, writing it all up, having two or three weeks to investigate, and then having the woman come in and say, but I love him, he didn't mean it, and he was a boyfriend, uh, or it was a husband, uh, and uh, he crossed the lane, but we're going to let him off this time. And... Uh, Rapes, no, rape, rape, as far as I'm concerned. I can definitely see both sides. I just think it. I'm not overly surprised at the number that don't go ahead. OK, let's have a look at the Times. Students turn against free speech amid a culture of conformity. There's a picture of the Queen at the uh, Remembrance Celebration looking very thoughtful, but I think they're trying to make her look as if she's fast asleep. She isn't. She's just contemplating. Well, she had a tear in her eye in some of the photos as well. Absolutely. So. And also the headline, the main headline from the Times, parties clash over the claim that Jeremy Corbyn will spend £1 trillion if he is named as Prime Minister. Where's he going to get that from? Uh, do, well, we have a, do we have a trillion pounds in the bank? Uh, well, <laughs> I, think we, if, I think you'll find, it, if we're being honest about it, we don't owe to the world as much as America funnily enough do, but we're 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 fairly badly down. I mean if if we were wandering we'd be in big trouble. But I, I just think if you didn't pay it back, what would happen? Who do you owe it to? And if you didn't pay well, it back, what would thing, happen? You see, this is the problem. <laughs> A lot of, of smaller countries have borrowed from Western banks, mm-hmm. Western countries, and you get to the point where they realise they're not going to get anything back. So they end up letting them off with it, which means what's the next thing they're going to do? They can ask for another loan. And then some other poor sucker says, oh, they, they must have paid that other one off. Did you pay that one off? Oh, <laughs> I, I think I, so. We, we it's that. almost like it's all virtual debt, isn't it? It's it's just uh, wipe, don't pay it, wipe it all off. I, I, I'll tell you. Let's just would, reset every country and then start afresh. Wish somebody could, uh, yeah. What do you do that when you reboot? Let's reboot my fan- <laughs> finances by just switching it off, switching them back on again mm-hmm. for the rest. Daily Mail, the diet that means you will never crave cake again. But you'd want to crave a bit of cake now and again, wouldn't you? Well, speaking yeah, personally, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a big cakey, but... I don't eat it often, but... I don't eat it often, but if I'm in a pub for a meal or something like that and there's chocolate okay, fudge yeah, cake on the are, menu, yeah, then I've it. just got to... <laughs> She's a sucker for it. And there's a picture of the Queen having a sob. In the hundredth year of the Cenotaph, the Queen's tears for the war dead. And then the second half, we'll change the Human Rights Act to protect troops... Vows Boris. The end of the veteran's witch hunt, he's calling it. Daily Mirror. Picture of the Queen having a sob. Uh, Red Dawn, because Liverpool obviously must have won today against Manchester City. And exclusive Labour pledge, £845 million for the forgotten children. Thousands of vulnerable kids to get individual mental health support in schools. Which sounds... uh, a positive thing. The Daily Telegraph. Tories to end unfair trails of troubles veterans. So the ones that were involved in uh, Sunday, Bloody Sunday. And the public, when they went in to chase an officer to take the blame, they weren't after the officer. They were after the person who ordered the officer to open fire, I think you'll find. The Independent. 
a time to remember, and you've got a picture of uh, them all lined up in their, their jackets, many, many royals and, uh, and Boris. And also, hospitals fight to stop drug dealing on the wards. I'd never heard of wow. this, but the staff have been forced to separate rival gangs as heroin admissions soar. Do you know, to me, I'm sorry, but I have been in uh, E&E needing to be stitched up, and I'm sitting there bleeding, and this guy walked in, this was Ashington, this guy walked in, stripped of the waist, with a naked man, well, not naked man, but a man stripped of the waist on his shoulders, and it's his son. This little C word has been using effing this substance again. You can effing sort him out and just threw him onto the floor. He hit his head like it could kill him, kind of. Stot. And then the nurses run up, they take him off and they take him straight in. I'm bleeding here. I'm bleeding through no fault of my own here. Did you mind? <laughs> And uh, but no, they take him straight through, and they spent uh, it was about another hour forty minutes before I was seen. Uh, they should, in my opinion, and this is not a good opinion. I think you probably find they should have a cage where they put dodgy people. Why should why should the dodgy people go instantly straight to the front of the queue? Because the the staff don't want trouble in the waiting room. I understand, but it means that all the decent people. Who have done the British thing by queue and bleed? That's what we were. I was sitting there queuing, <laughs> but everyone was livid. And bleeding, <laughs> and then you went straight to the front of the queue. Two, it, it led to an extra two hours on most people's um, bleeding lives. Mm. If you mean uh, that's nearly an arm, <laughs> nearly an arm there. Well, they've done well because you survived. Hurrah! Yeah, yeah. Uh, there you go. But no, I just think that they they shouldn't go straight to the front of the queue just because they happen to have taken heroin. No, uh, I'm sorry, but. Uh, Anyway, I'm old-fashioned. Let's move on. The Metro newspaper, the Queen, having a bubble. And the underneath story says, the poppy parade ambush. A thug launches a firework during the two-minute silence. Scummer. And where was that? I hope that's none of your hair. I'm going to click on it. And Where was it? Beside a derelict pub where the... It doesn't say where... The Remembrance Sun, Sun, uh, Parade, right? we know that, They're at the Cenotaph. Well, I hope the court... Them. Salford. Mm, I hope was, the court... Thank them. heavens it wasn't our lot. I would, I would hate, hate to think that uh, it was one of ours that did that. Salford. Financial Times, they did catch him. Lagarde's ECB team pushes for bigger say on decisions. Right. Good. What? <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of... Any headline in the Financial Times, that's what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Supposed to make ordinary people scratch their head and say, "No, I'll buy this." Take me about a month to I'll read buy that. the son of the star, or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, let's have your first or uh, your story uh, as it is now, Don. So we're having all these different ways of relaxation mm-hmm. and ways to avoid stress and things like that. Okay. A university in the Dutch city of Nijmegen. 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 Uh huh. Have come up with a new way for their students to get away from exam stress right oh flamey they've built a grave what a meditation grave so there's a chapel within the university grounds right. and at the back of the chapel they've dug an open grave for students to go in and it says it helps them cope with the exam stress and they can meditate and they call it a purification grave to help students reflect on the futility of their existence a bit cold. <laughs> it's a bit dark. It's like your and life's few. queuing up to get to to get in to get in to, and lie there. Is this just a Dutch? I'm sorry, but the the Dutch have red light districts. There, there's other ways of doing it. But you see, to me, I wouldn't want anybody. I'm not suggesting everybody. Tell you if you're feeling a bit low, get a prostitute. I'm not suggesting. <laughs> I'm just saying there's other there's other ways to lift yourself, but. For somebody to say to me, you're studying because you're students, right? Yeah. We want to fill your head with this. Why? Because when you've got all of this information and knowledge, then you can get a job and you can become hugely successful. You can have a lovely house, lovely holidays, meet somebody, have a nice family. Life is sweet and it's wonderful and fantastic. They're not there saying, 
Come sit in a hole and realise just how futile it all is. I'm sorry, but that's the but exact the, opposite of what a the student pictures should. that were shown as well showed somebody lying, and it's basically they've got a wooden ladder going down into it, and then oh. there was a girl lying, and it's just like a sheet. It is literally an open grave with a sheet in it, and she's just lying there with her arms across her chest as well, and it's, it's quite... <laughs> it is quite strange. Quite dark. I mean, what's yeah. wrong with the... I saw a glass uh, coffin online the other day. Glass coffin. So you can see them, see the remains to decay inside day by day. You but, live in your but who room. would see it though? I mean, because you, you obviously stick, stick your nana in the living room, mm -hmm. in the see-through. Because somebody did that. A Japanese person. This is about oh, blame me, fifteen years ago. Uh, he loved his wife so much, couldn't be parted from her. So had her embalmed That's and stuffed. put in the glass coffin. Ooh. Made the coffin into a coffee table. And has a... Uh, it bet it stunk a bit. I think that would have that. stunk after a while. Well, not if it's sealed. Hmm. Because it's, it's not the like... The juices of your body? Well, she's been embalmed. Embalming, is. <laughs> embalming gets rid of all the... Oh, does it? Yeah. Yeah, they sew your tongue Ooh. down and they put cotton wool at the back of your throat and oh, God. up your... But um, there must be some juices still in no, there. They put, no, they put... Up, just cork it. And from all the, <laughs> from all the high to the leak. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about people's families here. <laughs> they cork it, if you prefer. <laughs> okay, what's your story anyway? Yeah, we've all made some um, <laughs> cork <laughs> it <laughs> online purchases that you know. You know when you when you maybe you're a bit drunk and you go in and you buy things that you don't need. I ended up with two omelet mach uh, machines once. <laughs> Two. So you, <laughs> you're, you're an easy sell. In a well, it was just buy one, get one half price. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even need one. So I ended up two. <laughs> but this guy, he thought he was bidding on a, a hen. A chicken? A, yeah, like a chicken on an yeah. online auction site. Okay. But he won the... Chicken. Well, he won it, but then... He didn't read the small print because he'd actually he actually bought a thousand chickens <laughs> <laughs> wow. by accident. So how no hang on how much did how he much did he pay for one dollar fifty? It's in Australia. So there's got too many chickens. He just wants somebody to take me chickens. Well, exactly, but he'd already bought them, and you know it's, he got a thousand got chickens a thousand for a dollar fifty. That's wow. quite good, good. But it'd be worth. It. He's, he's got, got no room just to, just to get the next three weekends. So oh, no. uh, imagine the eggs off that. But yeah, he's, he's fair comment. He can't even provided pick them you've up. got a cockerel, because they never mentioned the cockerel in the deal. They just said hens. Well, so do you need the eggs? Yeah, but yeah. you need a cockerel to do you? to start it off. <laughs> but yeah. all, with all the thousands, so have you got one in amongst all these a thousand? Would it? He'd have to he, be. <laughs> he'd have to be a ginger <laughs> one. You do. You do know that an egg. Uh, from a chicken is basically a baby chicken. Well, yeah, but... <laughs> the... And you know what babies But I've never really <laughs> thought about it because people... So you're the, thinking that chickens... They lay a few a day. Some, don't they? Oh, well, a few a week, maybe. Oh, are you talking about a cockerel or are you talking about a chicken? I don't know. <laughs> a hen? They lay a few a day. They lay a few a day, don't they? Eggs? Eggs. So they're not getting fertilised a few times a day, are they? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the cockerel that's looking after you. I don't know. I'm going to have to look into that. I didn't really know how... <laughs> Now, can I just say, if anybody's <laughs> listening at home whilst on the computer, don't instantly type in sex life of a chicken. <laughs> just Does you'll... it need to be fertilised to lay an egg? <laughs> now, you see, this is the question. Do, are the eggs fertilised then? So, therefore, they will become a little chicky or not? If they're not taken away early. But, no. Yeah, because... Well, they, they must be, because do you ever get the egg that's got the little red dot yeah. in the yolk? The, or the little beak. I've, I've had one that's had been a little chick. No, I haven't yeah. for years. I think they're a bit better the, the spot than the these days. <laughs> I got one a couple of weeks ago, but that oh, little red dot is, mm. is, is the, the yeah. start of the embryo developing, so they must be fertilised to be able to lay the eggs. That, well, you know what they should do with a chicken? Cork it. That's what <laughs> I think they should do. Cork it. It's the way of the future, and that's where we're heading. We're going to take a quick break. That is what we call the block. of the North. Alan Robson's Night Owls. The phone-in that gets you talking. Greatest hits radio. Well, it's got a few of you talking, especially about chickens. <laughs> Tony, who knows about such things, um, he says chickens lay eggs without a cockerel present. 
if the eggs are fertilized, hence if there is a cockerel there, they will hatch. If there is no cock, they won't. There you go. There it is, official, from Tony Best. Thank you very much, Tor. So they lay eggs anyway. Now, you see, this has surprised me. Why do they lay an egg if they haven't got somebody there that can f fertilize one? But anyway, hey, we talk about that all night. Also, Omar's been on, and he is a big fan of Louise, we discover. So great hearing the interview with Louise. I've been a huge fan of her since the eternal days. Love the Halloween show on YouTube. We need more of the same, says Omar, who's actually in Harlow this week. There you go. And Dave and Donny have got in touch and they've sent me the Wikipedia page of the Quinton's Hill rail disaster, which is the multi-train crash that George from Lanchester was talking about. And when you get down to the aftermath of it, the initial estimate, they thought there was like 158 dead with over 200 uh, injured. Then they noticed that the Royal Scots train with Lieutenant Colonel Druitt's men, they had estimated 215 deaths and 191 Injured, some of them injured, I mean, losing legs and arms and what have you. Of the 500 soldiers of the 7th Battalion of the Royal Scots Guards, only 58 men were present for the roll call, along with seven officers. 226 people died, 246 injured, including the entire crew of the troop train. And the funerals, some of the bodies were never recovered, having been wholly consumed by the fire. And when the bodies of the men of the Royal Scots were returned to Leith on the 24th of May, they were buried together in a mass grave in Edinburgh's Rosebank Cemetery. The coffins were laid three deep, with each on the top row covered in the Union flag. The public were excluded from the ceremony, although 50 wounded soldiers who were convalescing, were allowed to attend. And uh, what an incredible story. And again, it's one of those amazing things that everybody living in this part of the world should know. Now, we're going to talk to Alison, but what about that eerie story we got from World War One? The First World War, this is ancient history oh, to yeah. a great many people now, yeah. and yet it was your parents. Yeah. What was your dad doing? Where was your dad in the First World War? Oh, he was in France. So he was in, uh, the Somme, or Wipers? Or... Yes, yes, he was there. Uh, he was in West Yorkshire. I can remember him saying he used to sit in the trenches full of water, you know, and it was rats running around, and oh, he said it was dreadful. He didn't talk much about it, actually. Well, his, his younger brother gave a false age for himself, and he got caught. He was went into the forces and he was killed he was never found his body was never found right. and he was only about 17 i think and mm. he lied about his age yeah just in. just to get in uh-huh he had uh, trench fever you know he was quite ill he was in the hospital he said his other brother was deafened he was hit in the head you know by the ear so he went down on the on the hms manchester he didn't die he was, he was in the water for hours on end you know right and funnily enough i knew he was that that happened mm. i was Stayed with my mother because we hadn't a house then, you know. Yeah. And lived with my mum and dad. And uh, through the middle of the night, I woke up and there was water running all over us, you know, mm. dripping on my head. Right. And so I felt it wasn't really. No. You know, I went through and I said, oh, man, man, there's something wrong. Yeah. There's something wrong, you know. And he had, at one o'clock when I woke up, that was when the ship was hit. It was amazing, you Isn't know. Isn't that weird? Yeah. That is weird. How about that? Now, Tim's been on to educate me about sex and thank you very much tim i knew this would happen with respect to the chickens and however tim you have put it in a very sensible way that even i understand tony's now he's a new man next door he's, he's looking up all kinds tim simply says alan if you think about it women produce eggs once a month okay that's without us but if they're fertilised, they would become pregnant. I get it. I get it. That's it. Blimey. Educating Robson. Should make a series of it. How about that? No, but they don't. Tony's saying, do they lay their eggs? Well, 
entertained of. Oh, blame me, we've started something else there. Instead, let's just bolt in the direction <laughs> of Alison from Anfield Plain. Hello, Alison. Hi there, Alan. Yeah, hello. I'm sorry, I can't stop laughing at this egg thing. Don't go into it, for heaven's sake. <laughs> If you if you lay them once a month, it's your business. <laughs> Not getting into it. Oh, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So what you got for us anyway, Ali? Well, well, first of all, I got a bit of a surprise before when uh, my husband came on to have a chat with you. Right, and especially because he's not with you at the moment. He's not with me, and he didn't tell me he was coming on, so I, <laughs> I didn't know. He, he sent me a text afterwards saying, surprise. Brilliant. This is Bob who was but on was, before, who was in yeah, Milton Keynes. He was on about his book. Yes, and he's right. And he has books everywhere. But you, you, why are you so stu- Just a few books. What's the problem? I'm not. <laughs> he has a bookcase in the living room. And the only thing that I say is that... No, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, on. well, he hasn't got a bookcase in the room. He said to me, and you can <laughs> rewind the tape if you like, I've got a <laughs> tiny little box next to where I sit, where I keep oh. me books. Because I did say, so do you have, like, what Lord Farquhar Harson has, which is books on all walls, like a big library room kind of thing. That's in one of the bedrooms that he's pinched. He's got shelves up everywhere. Ah, but I insist that the books in the living room are kept behind doors because we have a different view on books. He likes to sort his books into, um, like, kind of Genre. what they're about. Yeah, right, yeah. okay. I like books sorted in height, width, colour. <laughs> <laughs> right, so if he's got three war books, big book, little book, medium book, oh, you're, you're in big trouble there. Yeah. It would explode. <laughs> right. So it's got to look pretty for you. Yes, I've got my books in my office. He's got his books in his office. I just look at the shelves and they're just all over the place. But do your books, and do you ever read your books or do you just buy them because they happen to be seven inches? No. You, you I know, you know what I mean? Books, my books are completely different to his books. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but do you read yours? <laughs> I do, yes, I do sometimes, okay. but I'm very much. He likes, he likes going into second-hand bookshops and finding old Would books you? that you can't that aren't yeah. printed anymore and things like that. I, I really have an aversion to second-hand. Books. So hang on, here's the thing: you, you and he, you're out on a mooch. You just okay. go into a, I don't know, yeah, Anfield Plain. Let's okay. You go into a little, a little Durham village. <laughs> yeah. And there's like the antiques, old-fashioned books, knickknacks. You're go. You're looking for because you've got to have a passion that you go looking for because we all do. What's yours then? What floats your boat? Um. Oh. See, it's, it, I, I'm. Because he's looking I at the books want... and you're already annoyed with them. So what do you do <laughs> while that's happening? <laughs> I'm normally looking in the gardening section for something for my garden because my garden is my like kind of bit. So he goes off into the books and I just don't I don't like the smell of second hand books. I don't like the thought of how many hands have gone through. <laughs> <laughs> just but you you'd rather it. work in manure. Where do you think that's been through? Well, yeah, but it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we have different views about books. No, I gather. Uh, right. Okay. It's it's. I find this fascinating because you know they say, "Oh, opposites attract" and all of that. I think. Oh, it, we are. I think it does people's heads in when somebody else is getting their. Fit. For example, there's no gardening stuff around. It's just books, and he <laughs> wants to look at every book because they're all second hand and obviously cheaper. And you're thinking, "Oh, it's going to be a long day today." Yeah, that's normally what goes through my head. <laughs> <laughs> Can you not just say, look, you have 15 minutes there, I'll have 15 minutes in, name whatever shop you'd rather be in. No, because you have to compromise, don't you? So you kind of, as long as you're on an equal level, it's, it's fine. But, I, I know, but you don't do that. You'll be giving them the eyes. And then <laughs> you'll do, you finished yet? Have you got what you want? You know, but it'll all be sarky, won't it? It'll not be. Oh, I can't! I can't believe how lucky we are that you've got all these books. Oh, what a lucky man! You, what a great day you're having. You're not supportive like that, are you? You'll stand there with a face on. 
It's yeah. like what we do when you're trying clothes on in shops. We sit there with the other men, all with our faces on. <sighs> See, but I don't really like shopping, so I'm not that bothered. Okay. I'm so you, you're shopping. telling me that you haven't got a face on while he's looking at books? Well, no, because I normally just laugh because he buys that many and then he's got to carry them because I won't help him carry them. <laughs> and he always goes for really hard back, heavy books. And you're thinking that's not going to match any of my colour schemes. <laughs> And that's a really big one. It's not going to fit on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's got to go in the little box down beside where his chair is. Yeah. I love the fact that he's got a chair because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I haven't got a chair, like an official chair. I haven't got an official chair yet. But, oh, uh, he's got, a, he's got a, a garage as well that I'm not even allowed into. Oh, hang on. What's in there then? Oh, he's pride and joy, but we do share that love. That, that's something that we have in common. We've got a Morgan. Oh, there, there. Now that's that's a gorgeous thing, right there. Yeah, so th that's our kind of that's our time together. We do we go out to Morgan more than we do shopping. Right. Okay. And I wouldn't blame you if you had a Morgan. Well, you would, wouldn't you? That's the thing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So tell me about all the tech then, because you you were initially ringing about <laughs> tech and stuff. Yeah, we. we I, my dad um, was many many years ago. Well, it, it's thirty years ago yesterday since he died, so it was a long long time ago. Right. He. Um, he had a ZX Spectrum, and it was when he wow. got it, it was it was really funny because like my mom was like, "What are you getting that for? And why do you need that?" And it was set up in the middle of the living room, oh, and right. he had this huge desk, and it was set up in the middle of the living room, and it was just like we played on it every single night. And there's a game that I'm trying to remember. I was talking to Dawn about some of the other games, but there's this one that was like a, um, a puzzle game right. that you have to go through different rooms to get to the next room, to get to the next room. And then if you got to the central room, it was a big prize. Right. And obviously we, we never got to the central room, but it was just like <laughs> the whole aspect of it. It was more like a, um, it brought us together more than like kind of split everybody apart like they do now. Right, okay, now stay with us, Alison. I'll come back to you in a second. I know we've got to take a very quick break. We'll I'll come back to you on the on your end of it. In the meantime, okay. Night Owls, do any of you remember what that game with the rooms was called? We'll try and get an answer for you, your end of this. Just stay with you, Alison. We'll be back with you very, very soon. Yes, a little bit more to hear from Alison after this. One nine one four double eight three one double eight. This is Night Owls. And we were in the middle of a conversation with Alison from Anfield Pen. Hello, Alison. Hi, yeah. Hello, right. We think we know the name. <gasps> wow. Of the game. You're gonna say no, it's not that. And then that'll just shoot us down. But we think it's head over heels. Right. Nineteen eighty-seven. Yeah, it was one of the yeah. for a, a, a ocean software. Apparently, the player controls two characters, each with different abilities. Uh, head can jump higher than heels, control himself in the air, and fire donuts from a hooter to paralyze enemies. Does that remind you of anything mm. at all? No. 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 <laughs> well, I mean, you'd remember if you could fire donuts from your hood. Oh, I'm sure you? you couldn't fire donuts. <laughs> it was more like questions, and you were given a question. You went into a room, and you were kind of given a question right. or given a task, uh -huh. and you had to do that task, and that got you through to, like, the next room. So you never squirted the odd donut out your hooter? I cannot, no, I cannot <laughs> remember that. <laughs> Well, we we still haven't got it yet. So, Night Owls, if you recognise this game, do, do tell. So, anyway, oh, fantastic. you're talking about tech. That was the, the game you remember, the ZX uh, yeah. bit of kit. Is that the oldest bit of tech you've got at the moment? Um, I don't still have it. I would love to have one. I even ended up looking on eBay tonight to see if I could get one. Right. <laughs> Just to kind of go back to those memories of... Just when they like, like the sounds of when they're starting up, and yeah. and like back then, everybody was like so patient. Mm. Yeah, like the the time that it took to start them up used to build oh. the excitement. No, it, you you are right, and I remember. Uh, blame me, this is this is gonna make me sound even older. The I remember television. Forget the video games just for a second. I remember television when at the end of the night, usually about twenty past twelve. 
they'd play the national anthem uh-huh. and you would never switch the telly off mid national anthem. Yeah. You'd I actually can that. <laughs> you'd actually have to wait until it, you're not not in the middle, play like you traitor. Die that's you dog. Cool. You know, it, it was you had to wait until the uh the actual song was over and then it would go hum. <laughs> And then at the end of the home, it would eventually go to that little light. Then the entire picture went down to a dot that was it. in the middle. And once it got down to the dot, you were eligible to switch your television off and go to bed if you if you were lucky enough to be up that late. But I can even... Do you remember when they used to play national anthems at the end of a, a, a cinema picture? You know, you got those pictures. And then at the end, the film would end... Then they would, you'd hear, brrr, you knew the national anthem was coming. Some people would leg it during the titles, you know, to try and get out there so they didn't have to stop. Yeah. But if they didn't, they'd have to stand wherever they were, facing whatever direction they were going in, until the national anthem was over. Otherwise, some people in the cinema would absolutely take it the wrong way. Yo, cube, animals, how dare you! And all this kind of... Isn't it weird? But then, of course, the whole video game thing comes in big style. And can you remember Pong? The one on the television where it was with the two lines. Yeah, and you just went... I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I play that for hours and hours. And all you could do, you could either speed it up a little bit, which wasn't, yeah. it wasn't really fast. They were the hard levels. <laughs> hard level. All you had to do was all you had to do was hit the damn thing with a paddle, and you could keep that game without scoring going for years if you really yeah. put your mind to it. But uh, I must admit, uh, everybody was saying you can play it on your TV, and everybody went, "I can't believe." It. <laughs> And, I, and, and the I wires f- plugged into the two different sockets. Yeah, and you had all over the floor. Yeah, all over the floor, <laughs> all the way to the to the wherever you were sitting, and then you were <laughs> taking each other on as as if it was like the World Cup final or something. Yeah. And you're thinking at the end of it, if you compare that with the kind of stuff you can do now, where you can actually talk to people on the other side of the world and the people who are in the game. All at the same time, while shooting a zombie, while sitting in an aircraft. I mean, the, it's ridiculous where we've ended up, isn't it? it? It's like what I said, like, like it's 30 years for my dad, and my dad was quite a techie freak, and I think it would have blown his mind I bet, I what's bet. happened in those 30 years. Because no, he sure. didn't have mobile phones or anything. <laughs> it was just, you just think, like... And what's, the, what's the first thing? Whenever you watch, and I tell you, try watching... Any old-fashioned World War Two movie, and I promise you, what will happen in one scene, sooner or later, will be somebody needs an airstrike, but the radio's down, the radio's broken, the the radio's out, so it's been shot off the back of the radio operator, whatever. <laughs> but every war film pretty much has that scene where we're trying to get through, but. And you, they're tuning it, you know, like the old radios. Yeah. And within 15 years ish of the end of World War II, I can remember having, because I love old radios. One of my great passions is really old radios. Some before I was born, some around the time I was born. They just yeah. looked lovely. They were a bit of furniture, you know, they, they just yeah, looked they were. really nice. But the one thing I guarantee you'll find is the thing that I found when I was about eight to ten year old. You could it it had words on the screen of the radio. You know, you turned the handle and you could see uh-huh. where the, the little lane went. And one yeah. of them one of them said uh Moscow and you'd go give over. So <laughs> then you'd have to <laughs> Then you'd hear a guy speaking Russian. Yeah. Like how cool. In, in 1964 yeah. or whenever that was, how cool was that? Then you could go to Luxembourg, which had a trendy station on it. Yeah. <laughs> go back and have a listen. How cool. But you could see where you were going. And you yeah. didn't have to go, you know, like now you'd go, 
it's 95 point or 111 point or it's 62 point. None of that digital business. It had oh, a yeah, little, in it. some, in, for, for Radio Paris, it even had the Eiffel Tower in a little <laughs> tiny sketch. So you're going <laughs> flying and then you hear the Frenchy people talking French. And how amazing is that? And yeah. I, I just thought that was the absolute bee's knees uh, back at the time. And you'd listen for like half an hour, not understanding anything that anybody was saying. And then you discovered the police band. Yeah. <laughs> and that changed your world. That then it was. Yeah, because you thought, should I be listening to this? And you knew you shouldn't. So you yeah. listened even more. Yeah. And you'd hear somebody's pinched a car and you'd be going, I know who that'll be. I yeah. know who that'll know be. know where they come, that's come from. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I just it, think technology's it, changed so, so much to, in in so many ways, and yet I kind of miss the naivety of a lot of the early stuff, if if that makes. Yeah, sense. and and the thrill of it as well, because it takes a lot now to kind of get somebody excited about something, because mm. it's kind of like everybody's like wanting something in a second so if it's not there mm. in a second yeah. and I know like from myself I've got a laptop and I've got a, a, a Mac right? and I can't use the laptop now because it's like oh for goodness yeah, sake yeah, yeah, yeah. and and you're just kind of like you're thinking and you think how sad is that that the world is turning so fast mm. that to sit and wait for a few minutes for something to open something that we used to take so much for granted not that long ago that we kind of, it's progressing so fast. But on the other hand, how lucky are we to have been alive through this? No, you're, you're absolutely right. When you were talking about the time that it takes to, to get through certain things, reminded me, and I've mentioned this on the show before, when a friend of mine, I got my first fax machine, mm-hmm. and I thought I was being terribly office oriented. I, <laughs> I have a printer now, I now have a fax. I yeah. I have an official proper office, and yeah. uh, then my mate said, "Ah, I've got this picture," and it was of some semi-naked woman, well, probably fully naked woman, and he said, "He said I'll send you the picture. Oh, you should have it." Ooh, and he was he'd go out, so you go on and send you the picture. But the facts being the facts, it was like, and because it was a bit like a uh, a pinup from one of these girly magazines, yeah. This is like 20 minutes of your life just <laughs> sitting here. I can see the top of her head now. <laughs> like 10 minutes later, I'm up to her eyebrows, up to her eyebrows. And you're thinking, it's going to be, this is a day I'm never going to get back. Uh, yeah, but it was, it was still good to just, just be able to. I think like that's why everybody's so stressed these days because everybody wants everything so fast and mm. so mm. imminent that it's like, ah. Oh, well, kind of back then, we knew that we just had to wait. Yes. <laughs> there was no option. That's true. You just had to wait. You are spot on. Hey, good stuff, Alison. Uh, can, can I just, before I go, I've had a text off the other half. Uh-oh. He's found the game. Oh, it's what is it? Labyrinth. Labyrinth. Oh, hang on. I'm gonna, let, me, let me look it up. Labyrinth. Labyrinth. The game. Uh, he's found it. Probably found it in a book of indeterminate Probably. shape. Yeah, he'll have one with him in, the little, in his little mobile book case that he takes with him when he goes away. At the side of his chair. Um, Ravensburger Labyrinth. Navigating traps and shifting walls in a race for treasure. Yeah, that was it. Oh, Teaching children that, skills like cause and effect, planning, recognition, how to take turns. Like a game of chess, players must plan ahead and answer questions. Yeah. Sounds right. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, that's well the done. So Labyrinth. many memories back for me. So well, many memories. At least you'll be able to look for it now as well. I will do, yes. I'm going to go on eBay and I'm going to look for a package that's got it. Good Labyrinth. And bo- I'll let you know. Do you want the, 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 the game for the ZX? Because there's a board game version apparently. Oh, right, is there? There's a board game out for between two and four players. It's been available since 1986. Labyrinth, oh. board game. So if you didn't want to go the other route, because I, I don't know whether it, it you know, obviously it was for the ZX, don't know what it would be yeah. available for now. I'm sure it would be available somewhere. But uh, 
there's a board game as well, just to let you know. Anyway, thank you, Alison. Thank you. Bless the pair of you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Cheers. Bye bye. Ah, blamey. We're getting to the to the grist of the mill, so to speak. Now, Linda from Barris Ford, who had her fabulous party the other week, uh, is on the lane. But just before that, a little bit of music. And I had a conversation with Boy George about, well, essentially, what he thought of himself. I don't know about anyone else, but certainly for me, um, you know, there are certain people that I really need in my life and mm. I really value having them in my life. And, um, and you know, a lot of those people were people that kind of couldn't be around me when I was a mess, you know, sure. but are, are quite happy to to be around me now that the, the sun is <laughs> the sun is shining and the birds are singing. <laughs> I can remember you in the in the dark days and there was the opportunity of, of doing an interview that I tu- I turned down because you were on you were kind of you weren't really human. <laughs> you were you were this <laughs> you were just somewhere else, but you weren't where I was, I was for sure. And uh, yeah. it's just wonderful because you you're easier to like, easier to love when you're just you. And because you it's you forget the yes in your lifetime, you have been full of frills and the occasional gimmick, like anybody in the music business. And yet when it boils down to you just being you, you're fascinating, you're interesting, you're talented, because you got it all together. Yeah, I think some people spend their lives kind of trying to be something they're not. And I think the lucky ones grow into themselves. I suppose mm. that's the best way to describe it. I think, <laughs> you know, I've I've kind of probably had my struggles with with learning to be myself. And I think... I hope I've nailed it now. You know, um, you know. I think I'm there. You know, <laughs> I think so. Too. I always say, like the dragons, I'm out. You know, in terms of all the, in the kind of negative stuff. You know. I, I... 